Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Pepa, for the introduction. Um, so what I would like to, wait, I have to, yes. Um, so I would like to talk about my experience with pulmonary rehabilitation for post COVID-19 in our center, as I said. I have some problem advancing my slides. Yes, so these are my conflicts of interest. None of them relate to the topic of my presentation today. So in the next 10 to 12 minutes, I would like to briefly address the COVID-19 as a systemic disease, talk about some of the functional impairments you can expect after the disease, and talk about inpatient uh, post-acute COVID-19 rehabilitation in our center, and especially about my experiences with that so far. So as you are probably all aware, COVID-19 is more than just a respiratory infection. Obviously, we know that respiratory symptoms are the main uh, symptoms of these patients, but that other organs are also involved, especially thromboembolic uh, processes play an important role in the clinical course, but also liver and, um, and kidney problems. We know that these patients have cognitive impairments and also loss of smell and taste is very common. What is not shown in this figure immediately is that a lot of these patients with COVID-19 also lose a lot of weight during their infectious period, have muscle wasting and tremendous deconditioning. And we must not underestimate the tremendous impact of this disease on the psychological symptoms of, of these patients, especially anxiety, fatigue, and depressive symptoms are very common. We also know that polyneuropathy uh, occurs, especially in those that were admitted to the intensive care, and that at least uh, a proportion of these patients will develop long-term lung uh, function abnormalities, which will be addressed uh, this afternoon in the talk by James Chalmers. Well, we know from subjects that survived acute critical illness that the post-intensive care syndrome is quite common. As you can see from this figure, there are several domains of this uh, post-intensive care syndrome. A lot of these patients experience functional disabilities, almost 25% uh, of them do. Psychological problems are common and also, and that's probably the most common, cognitive impairments. As you can see also, there's tremendous overlap between these different domains. Also after several months, uh, of, also several months after the acute injury. Currently, we do not have any data on the post-intensive care syndrome in those that survived COVID-19, especially those on intensive care. And we also do not know about the occurrence of these symptoms in those with less severe COVID-19. These are some data that come from, uh, from Italy, in which they studied the physical functioning of COVID-19 patients at the moment that they are discharged from the hospital. This is a very recent study, obviously, in which you can see in blue bars the pro proportion of patients that is unable to perform a certain activity by themselves. For example, you can see that two thirds of the patients that are discharged from the hospital are unable to do stair climbing. Two thirds are unable to go to a bath. Uh, for example, toilet use, one third of these uh, discharged people are not able to go to the toilet by themselves. And you can also see the other problems uh, presented here. So I guess there's a clear need to increase the physical condition of these patients at the moment that they are discharged from the hospital. And this is why we thought our center could play an important role in the post-acute care for these COVID-19 patients. So just to briefly introduce our center, it's a center of expertise for, the, for patients with complex chronic lung diseases. It's located in the south of the Netherlands, and our main shareholder is the Maastricht University Medical Center, where we have 70 beds for inpatient care, care mainly consisting of inpatient pulmonary rehabilitation for a duration of eight weeks. Um, and we combine rehabilitation with, let's say, specialized treatments for those uh, with chronic respiratory illnesses. And our main focus normally is on subjects with COPD. Therapies consist of exercise training, nutritional counseling, psychological support, and so on. So what happened when the SARS-CoV-2 uh, pandemic struck our country? Well, on March 13th, we uh, interrupted all our non-acute care 
activities and also our scientific activities. You must imagine we have 70 very severely ill chronic respiratory patients in our center walking around and we were unable to distinguish between those with respiratory symptoms as a result of COVID-19 or as a result of their chronic respiratory disease. So we thought it was no longer safe for them to be in our elective care program. We continued our palliative care ward, of course, and we started developing a program for post-acute uh, pulmonary rehabilitation for uh, COVID-19. This required some internal redesign because we had to uh, design a ward uh, with all the isolation measures for these patients. And we also had to draft protocols on how to treat these uh, subjects. And then we had to, to negotiate with the healthcare insurance companies and, and the government in the Netherlands on how this type of care would be reimbursed. Well, and then at the end of March, the first three of these post-acute COVID-19 patients were admitted to our center. And until now, we had treated uh, 28 of them. And this might not seem a lot to you, but I need to mention to you that we focused very much on those with an underlying respiratory condition. For example, patients with severe emphysema that developed COVID-19 or those with post-lung transplant, for example, that survived COVID-19. In May, we already started our regular care uh, with, of course, the social distancing measures as we have them now in our country. So what did our program look like? Uh, mainly, we provided acute respiratory care for these subjects. So we continued oxygen therapy, tracheostomy care that has been initiated in the hospital, obviously their uh, regular medications and management of their underlying respiratory conditions and comorbidities. Our nurses played an important role in the program because a lot of these patients were care dependent, uh, required coaching, and also the nurses played an important role in contacting with their family because families were not allowed to visit our center at that time. Then we provided personalized exercise training for these patients, I will show you in a minute. And since a lot of them lost tremendous amounts of weight, nutritional support, occupational therapy for, the, for the problematic daily activities, psychological support, and also speech therapists was, were involved. And as I mentioned, we, we focused very much on those with underlying respiratory diseases. So what were the main challenges we experienced? First of all, that these patients were still contagious at the moment that they arrived from the hospital. So we had to be very careful uh, regarding our traditional patient population, especially those on the palliative care unit and also our healthcare uh, professionals. Uh, because of the fact that they were contagious, we were limited in our assessment. We could not perform any lung function testing or cycle ergometry as part of our rehabilitation program. There were at that time no criteria when we could lift these isolation measures. And there was also a concern, a constant concern about the availability of personal protective equipments, as we have seen all over the country and Europe, actually. And then because of the social isolation measures, it was difficult for these patients to, to be in our center away from their home and their loved ones for so long of time. And as I said, at the moment that we started this program, we were uncertain whether we were getting any funding for these programs. So what does the exercise training look like? Most of these patients started with neuromuscular electrical stimulation. This is what this looks like. So it's electrical current applied to the lower extremities of the patient uh, two times a day at a high frequency. And, uh, and this is a way in which we also train our most severe uh, chronic respiratory patients, those that are unable to do traditional forms of exercise training. And this is actually a patient, one of the first patients that was admitted to our center with COVID-19. You can see the protective measures in our uh, physiotherapist. Then one of the other exercises they did was bed cycling, as you can see on the right here. Also uh, done once a day uh, for two times five minutes, a bit of uh, based on the clinical experience of the physiotherapist. Other therapies we did was cycle ergometry on the isolation ward, stair climbing also on the isolation ward. You can see in the back here, the wall we placed uh, to isolate these patients from the, from the other part of the center. And you can see we actually did group training 
for those that were still in their contagious phase of the disease. And then on the patient room, they performed sputum evacuation techniques themselves. There were no healthcare professionals around because of uh, 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 droplets that might be produced. And obviously we continuously monitor, monitored oxygen saturation, heartbeat, and oxygen was supplied in great amounts. So what were the challenges regarding the isolation measures? As I said, there were no criteria at that time. So we developed our own protocol. This was a protocol we internally discussed and we, which we applied. So if the patient was more than 14 days after his initial day of hospital admission, if his symptoms had normalized or disappeared, uh, and if he had at least two negative PCRs on a nose throat swab, of more than two, 24 hours separate, then we lifted the isolation measures. Patients were transported to another ward where they could, let's say, have a more traditional pulmonary rehabilitation program. So what were my experiences with this? Well, first of all, we saw that there's a, there was a large variation in the needs of care uh, between these patients. Some had severe physical impairments, other mainly had, let's say, an anxiety problems or cachexia, so there was a, a huge variation. Also a large variation in the rate of recovery. Some of them came, came in with, for example, six liters of oxygen per minute, which could be reduced or stopped within a week. Others took some more time. Also the, the tracheostomy care, um, yeah, it was very variable. And also the way that the patients recovered in their exercise capacity. Uh, we did not experience any adverse events so far. Luckily, we did not have any infected co-workers so far. And uh, although we are collecting structured data of our program, we do not have any results of that uh, yet. So what we do not know at this moment is what will be the remaining burden of disease for a lot of these patients, not only those that were on the intensive care unit, but also those that had milder disease or were treated at home. We know from some studies now that at least three months after the acute infection, uh, especially fatigue, dyspnea, and chest tightness are still very common, reported by more than 70% of these uh, COVID-19 subjects. We also do not know whether this early rehabilitation is actually useful or whether the natural course of disease will also uh, decrease the symptoms. There are obviously alternative models for rehabilitation, rehabilitation performed at home or in an outpatient setting, which might be more challenging, uh, especially if these patients are still contagious, but we have not compared the results yet. We also do not know what we, would be the results of a high intensity exercise training program, especially because of the cardiovascular complications. We decided to have a low intensity program for now. We are interested to know what will be the actual percentage of COVID-19 subjects that develop chronic lung function impairments. Some data are being published um, every week at the moment, but on the longer term, obviously we do not know. And the same is true actually for other outcomes. So at the end, um, for those of you interested in pulmonary rehabilitation for COVID-19, I kindly refer to this document, which was published in the ERJ in August in which a committee of a task force, so to say, of the ERS and the ATS published some expert opinions on how to organize uh, care for, especially uh, rehabilitation care for COVID-19. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, again for inviting me to give my talk.